Good day and welcome. Today we are presenting Mine Water Management, Instrumentation and Automation Innovation. My name is Sylvie Bufa, Principal at BHP and Secretary of the CIM Environmental and Social Responsibility Society, ESRS. On behalf of ESRS, we thank you for joining us today. Some housekeeping before we get started. There will be a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Please type them in the question box in the control box. If you cannot locate the question box, please type your question in the chat box or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon in the control panel. We will unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask your questions. And now, without further ado, we are pleased to present the moderators for today's presentation. Mr. Matthew Utter. Matthew is an environmental scientist at CanMet Mining at Natural Resources Canada and member of the Water Group of the ESRS. Hey. Welcome, Matthew. Perfect. Excellent. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Sylvie, for the introduction. And a welcome to everyone for uh, joining us today for the webinar. Uh, to quickly introduce myself, my name is Matt, and I'm a member of CIM's ESRS Water Group. Uh, ESRS is the Environmental and Social Responsibility Society of CIM. And if anyone is interested in learning about new technologies or engaging more with various aspects of the mining industry, we are always looking for new members. I myself am a recent new member, and this will be my first time as moderator. So I appreciate your patience and understanding as I go through this for the first time. Uh, for myself, I am mainly involved in membrane technology research for the treatment of mind impacted waters. My work includes links with critical minerals with a focus on technology development for lithium recovery from brines. I'll now be starting off this webinar with a brief safety share. I'm sure this has been brought up many times with work from home more prevalent than ever. But if you're anything like me, an extra reminder to be as ergonomic as possible never hurts. So keeping your feet flat on the ground and back up straight will keep your back supported and healthy. So for our agenda today, we will have three panelists who are going to show us some very exciting developments in water instrumentation and sampling technologies. First will be Brooks Magnowski of FredSense Technologies, followed by Craig Milne of Copperstone Technologies. And our third presenter will be Frank Vanderhave of Hoskin Scientific. Each presentation will last for approximately 15 minutes. Afterwards, we will have a quick roundtable Q&A where we will review and answer all the questions that have been asked. We welcome questions for one specific presenter or all presenters as a group. Please type in the questions as we go. Sylvie and I will put them aside and bring them, bring them back up at the end. We have 15 minutes dedicated for this, but if there is a lot of interest, we can continue past the hour up to 1.30 p.m. We certainly understand that everyone has busy lives, so please join us for as long as you're able to. For our first presenter of the day, we have Brooks Magnowski, Head of Business Development for FredSense Technologies. Brooks is a Master of Chemical Engineering with 12 years of sales and engineering experience in the oil and gas refining, agriculture, and mining sectors, focusing on water chemistry and corrosion. Being a family man and having a love of the outdoors, this fuels his environmental stewardship and a fervor for water quality is no exception. So I'll pass the floor now over to you, Brooks. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Matthew. Um, just to make sure that I am sharing everything properly here. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen here and I'm going to maximize it. Are you able to see my, my full screen there? Yep, we can see your full screen. Excellent. All right. This is great. It's working out well. Um, 
All right, so my name is Brooks Magnowski, as Matthew uh, mentioned, uh, with been with FredSense for a little while now. Um, you know, extensive experience in water chemistry, uh, extensive experience in corrosion, and um, a, a bit of a new foray for me into drinking water and mining applications uh, for, for water chemistry. Uh, so today we're going to talk a bit about how uh, FredSense can be applied for mine water. Um, specifically within the arsenic space, as well as uh, selenium, and I'll mention that a little bit later on some stuff that we're working on into the future. All right, so as most of you know, getting real-time data is difficult if you're working in the water chemistry space uh, within any application. Um, sending samples to the lab can be difficult uh, just because of the fact that if you have to make process changes, um, then there's an issue uh, because there's a delay. Um, a delay of up to five to ten days or even up to two weeks can cause uh, quite a bit of problems within um, people's uh, operations uh, when it comes to making process changes. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to empower uh, the, the end user or the operations team or engineer team uh, in order to make those choices, those, those changes, and to make decisions in the field uh, more readily, what, rather than having to wait and ship to the lab uh, to receive their information. We're trying to give it, put it directly in your hand. Um, so what we're trying to do and what we've been doing is we are essentially giving lab quality data in the hands of the operations team and engineers rather than having to send to the lab, as I mentioned. So we do this in quite a unique way. Uh, this is just an image of our uh, mixer, which is one part of our process. Uh, with, a, with a mix and chemistries together, in order to be able to get uh, to the kind of accuracy that we're looking for. Um, it's near real time. Uh, it's not entirely real time. Uh, it takes, does take two and a half, just a half hours to run a test, and I'll get into a bit of that uh, a little bit later. So how we do this is we use biology. And um, I'll explain that in not this slide, but the next one. So in the mining use cases, what we want to focus on is you know baseline measurements is what you can do basically for anywhere around a mining site. Uh, for environmental assessment. I mentioned treatment optimization. That's a huge factor. Obviously, removing some of these chemistries before effluent uh, is, is, is uh, uh, you know, released into the environment. You know, that's a concern. Um, so you want to make sure you drop down your analyte con concentrations to their effective uh, limits. Uh, you know, regulatory monitoring, that's something that we're working on. Um, you know, in some cases, it supplements regulatory monitoring for us, but in a lot of cases, the regulatory monitoring has to be done uh, via EPA, at least in drinking water cases, EPA. Uh, there are a number of other regulatory bodies that need to be consulted uh, when you're looking at regulatory monitoring, and that's done on a, a typically quarterly or biannual basis. Uh, our goal is to help supplement uh, regulatory monitoring. Our goal eventually is to become a, a regulatory device, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, so plume detection is another uh, really helpful way in which you can use our kit uh, for you know monitoring for years to come for mine water, you know after after closure. Um, so this is Fred. Uh, he's a little tiny E. coli bacteria, and Fred also stands for Field Ready Electrochemical Detector. And so what we've done is we've taken little pieces of genetic components within a, a E. coli bacteria, and we've essentially amplified it. We've made lots of it, and we've made it readily available. And what happens is this bacteria comes in contact with arsenic, for instance, or any other contaminant that we've developed a sensor for. And it upregulates this genetic component, and it essentially produces a protein that can be electrochemically measured. So similar to any kind of cathode anode type redox potential or pH or, or ORP. Uh, that's essentially how we measure uh, the, the analyte of concern. It's directly correlated back to the actual concentration. Um, so it's quite unique. Nobody else is really doing this. We're essentially using the, the machinery of a cell and the machinery of genetics in order to uh, enable uh, this really accurate uh, detection of chemistry at the field level. So at the level of, of, of an operator in the field, takes a sample, does a little bit of chemistry, and then gets a result and doesn't have to worry about sending it away for the lab. It's near real time, or we say real time, uh, but as I mentioned, it takes about two and a half hours to run the test. So it's quite simple. Uh, you just fill a cartridge and you place it into the detector, you wait, 
and then you get your results. Now, there are obviously a few more steps here because there are some reagent addition that needs to be done. The total process is, as I mentioned, two and a half hours roughly, between two and two and a half hours. So you, you can see here, if you can see my cursor moving around, um, you, we've got uh, on the far left, uh, you, you would have a zero, and then in the middle would be your actual sample, and then on the far right, it's actually a high mark. So, you know, basically for a correlation or a uh, trend um, calibration table that gets created each and every time one runs a test, uh, that calculation is all done within the software. So there's no calibration that needs to be done when you run this test. It's calibrated essentially every single time uh, when someone runs a test. Um, because we're essentially using the water that is the sample to, to make it so that we can remove any matrix effects. Um, as you can imagine, matrix effects are also removed because of the high specificity in using a genetic uh, marker in order to uh, measure these analytes because it really is a one-for-one -one interaction. Uh, you, you don't often see and we have not seen uh, much cross, uh, uh, you know, a uh, competition uh, with our binding sites for any kinds of other similar analytes that might be in a, in a solution. So we get really good specificity, and that allows us to get really good protection. So the kit is is roughly 12 inches by six by 10, and it weighs roughly 10 pounds. Um, so it's not that large, uh, but it, it, it's, you know, you can carry it around and, and put it in the back of a truck and, uh, or, or back of a, a, a small laboratory and, uh, and run the tests. Uh, it's also battery powered, so it's completely mobile. Um, this is a printout of our, our, our software, that, you know, that allows it to show you how exactly our, well our test is running. It runs through a series of QC and it gives you a time date stamp as well as a GPS coordinates. There are four QC measurements that goes through. I don't need to get into that too much, but it's basically trying to give us a really quality measurement. Uh, as you can see, these are for drinking water, you know, green being, you know, below five, uh, 10 being MCL, uh, between five and 10, you know, we, we, we want to start being concerned with how the treatment operation is, is, is running. And then anything above 10 is out of compliance. And this is specifically drinking water. Um, so Fred, as I mentioned, no calibration. Uh, we can get down to a two parts per billion detection limit for arsenic. And uh, with a plus or minus two PPB or 20% accuracy as compared to the analytical lab. Um, you know, I mentioned the time. And I just wanted to highlight here, you know, we demonstrated this technology with a number of incubators and a number of uh, laboratories that have shown, we've shown that we've been able to be quite in line, uh, you know, with the ICTMS, that's typically the standard uh, for, for any kind of water analysis uh, for arsenic. So uh, what we can do also is we can speciate. So if, if one wants to determine how well the arsenic removal technology is working, not only to test for total arsenic, but for uh, arsenite, uh, you know, that, that also is, is a, a, something we can do. Uh, Essentially, there's a speciation that can occur where we can just either not oxidize or 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 oxidize all of the sample uh, to the total arsenic, uh, arsenic five. I mean, uh, we've got a number of customers already. Uh, most of them groundwater. One of them being in a mining application, Agnico Eagle, um, and uh, you know we've got a number of other regulatory bodies that have tested our unit out as well. Um, I wanted to just highlight one more time, just showing you on the left here, those are the ones where we currently got in, in operation. Uh, and in our queue uh, for the technology development, we've got iron, manganese, selenium, lead, BTEX, nitrate, and nitrite, as well as PFAS. If you're familiar at all with uh, PFAS, it's a very, very interesting and difficult thing to remove uh, within uh, the water space. Uh, selenium being very applicable for, for mining applications, we're easily between six months to a year away from the majority of these on this list from being deployable. And so we've been about nine months or so on arsenic, and then the next phase is for us to bring in the rest of these analytes. I've got a series of case studies I'd like to show you here. One, the first one again is groundwater. Our, our, our technology so far has predominantly been used in groundwater, but we are definitely doing some work in mining and we've got a case study to show you what what we've done in mining as well. Um, 
So we've got a utility here uh, in Arizona where they utilize groundwater that's heavily contaminated with arsenic. And, you know, we needed to demonstrate that we could get down to 2 ppb and do it well. And we wanted to compare our data to an EPA lab. Uh, this, 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 uh, this system that they currently use is a coagulation filtration system, but there are two other systems that, that one can use to, to remove arsenic, uh, and that's blending or adsorption and ion exchange. Blending is very crude. You're not even removing it. You're really just diluting it. And then absorption and ion exchange is another form of, of, of removal system. So what we found in this test, and I want to highlight this just so that you can see uh, the raw water here in the middle, the well B, you can see how well we compared to the black, the green and the black, the white being an atomic absorption system that is used as a process lab. Uh, and then you can see the treated sample for well B. Now, what they've done here is, is they say they've essentially blended back in their raw water. So this saves them on the cost of, of their treatment. So when they are able to blend back in with their raw, raw water, they can easily show that there's this cost savings there because they don't have to treat a certain component of that water uh, and to stay below that 10 ppb mark. Uh, if they can stay anywhere between 6 and 9, then they can know that they're below 10. Uh, getting up to nine is a little bit suspect because we know our error is up to plus or minus two parts per billion, so we always recommend staying below eight. So, uh, with the Canadian Mining Innovation Council, or CMIC, we also demonstrated our arsenic measurement with a gold site mine in Quebec. Uh, we demonstrated detection again down to two parts per billion. Uh, we decreased the cost of their operation up to 30% on their materials for arsenic removal. And we showed that the system could pay for itself within three to six months. And that would depend on the site, but for this one, this was the case. Um, so we essentially, we sampled a tailings matrix in a gold mine. Uh, I don't have data here showing you how well we uh, uh, um, adhered to the ICPMS tests, uh, but you can expect that they were similar to the, the last case study that I showed. What this case study was meant to show is essentially that we were able to essentially test arsenic in each of the basins. So there's, there's three basins and then a final effluent. Basin one, two, and three are the blue, green, and purple. And then the final effluent is the pink at the bottom and purified water. So essentially what we're trying to show here is that we were able to, there was no arsenic removal here, uh, but what was happening is us showing that we can measure arsenic at each of those stages, um, essentially, at different concentrations from different sample locations. Uh, so the really big goal here, are, oh, I'm going to go back, sorry, one second. Oops. Apologies. Oh, don't know why this happened. That was not. I don't know why that did that. Apologies for the little delay here. But I'm going to go back to this one. Sorry about that. Um, the, the big thing we wanted to show here is that we can test for arsenic within the really difficult uh, mine water matrices. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that's always been a big concern. What we asked if anybody wants to try to use our kit out for measuring arsenic in a gold mine or any other mining application is that we just ask for some sample water first before we do a, a pilot. Um, you know, what we're doing right now is we are offering pilots to, uh, to many of our customers if they're interested uh, or, or pilot partners to test out uh, of the ability to get some much quicker arsenic data. Uh, and we would just like to test some of that water first uh, before we do any deployments. And so the last uh, one I want to just talk about is selenium, which is the next one that's on our, our, our block for uh, deployment. Uh, it should be available here within the next um number of months uh, we're thinking in the in terms of three to six months we're going to be ready to deploy selenium and so we are looking for pilot partners once that's ready to go um and as most of the listeners will know as well is that selenium is an issue um and um you know it it it, it needs to be removed and it, it has certain limits uh, surface water is two parts per billion uh groundwater you know can be as high as 50 as well as livestock water it can be 50 um, so it's quite low uh, limits for, uh, for selenium detection for an effluent system. Um, 
And as you're well aware, most likely the predominant way to remove it is an uh, anaerobic PCR, um, you know, where you can remove it from, you know, from roughly 200 down to one uh, parts per billion. So our kit is currently being designed to be able to get down to one parts per billion. Um, you know, we're, we're aiming, and we've already seen some preliminary results that we can get to, uh, you know, high three digits of parts per trillion in terms of accuracy. And then our high mark will typically be somewhere between 10 and 20 parts per billion if the detection limit is, is one that, that one is aiming to, to go after. So. Okay, well, thank you for your time today. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions or wants to contact me after the presentation, please just let me know. Um, other than that, I thank uh, everybody in the, for attending and I thank Matthew for moderating. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brooks. That was an excellent presentation of both your current sensors and uh, future sensors that you'll be using for monitoring. I'd also like to add, it's not truly an online webinar without some IT hiccups. So honestly, no problem at all about that. <laughs> uh, now I want to take the opportunity to introduce our second speaker, Craig Milne, CEO of Copperstone Technologies. So Craig has designed and developed an innovative robot, Helix, for a number of site investigation services. Craig is an experienced leader, serial entrepreneur, driven by curiosity, commitment, and creativity. Looking forward to hearing more, Craig. Pass it over to you now. Thank you, Matt. I am just looking for the, there we go, just my share screen, there we go. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I trust everything is shared okay right now, man? Looking good, whatever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, Copperstone, we are an Edmonton-based uh, robotics company. Um, we're, we're highly inspired by the Mars rover missions. Uh, we always start by talking about space robots, really, because it's, it's kind of the inspiration for what we do. Um, you know, NASA sends robots to Mars because they're horribly hazardous environments. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to send a robot to Mars than it is to send a human crewed mission. Uh, and robots can do amazing things that people really just can't do. Um, you know, some of the Mars robots have been operating for nine years, continuously collecting samples and, and doing investigation of, of, uh, of the planet. Uh, and that's kind of what we see our job here on Earth. Um, we, we're really focused on tailings uh, as our as our first uh, uh, and main priority. We've done some work with Valet and they put this uh, little cartoon together which really summarizes our entire business uh, nicely for us. Um, and so, you know, Valet had the challenge of, of being able to investigate tailings without um, putting people at risk. Uh, they obviously, in Brazil, they have some significant problems with tailings dams. Um, and so we were able to demonstrate our robotic technology, um, which, which is able to get out onto tailings, uh, operating at long distances. And in this case, they were most interested in geotechnical uh, sample and data collection. So things like CPT uh, or actual tailing samples. Um, and there's obviously a large impact for them to be able to get data where they couldn't do that before. Um, but we're here mostly to talk about water today. Um, and of course, water has a huge impact on tailings, both in the in terms of uh, reclamation and stability of, of tailings dam and, and all of that, um, as well as recycling of water back into the operational operations of the plant. A lot of the investigations for um, uh, tailings and water involve uh, either human crewed equipment, uh, people out in boats doing uh, sonar surveys or collecting water samples, that's very common. Um, amphibious excavators, that's another, that's another way of getting out onto site. Um, and of course, if there's not that much water around, there's, there's trucks and tracked vehicles that, that are pretty good as well. Um, but all of these are putting people on tailings, which is, is something I think generally people are trying to avoid these days. Um, there's safety, cost, and, and just inefficiency in general in, in doing all of those techniques. So what Hopperstone has done is we've, we have sort of reinvented uh, uh, an old design based on around a screwdriver propulsion. Um, and all of our robots are based on this technology. We have, we have a, some patents around how that all works. 
But our robots have uh, large pontoons that allow them to float in water. Uh, they're all four-wheel drive vehicles, um, the wheels being these screws. Uh, and they can turn either all together and drive the vehicle forward um, like, a, like four propellers basically on a boat. Uh, they can also turn independently and become like wheels on a car. So we can drive efficiently on hard ground, soft mud, snow, and open water. Uh, and then, then the rest of the robot is all designed to carry equipment either required for sampling or, or measurements on tailings. This is an example of a small robot that we built. It's doing a bathymetric survey in a gold tailings pond. It's carrying a sonar head underwater, um, traveling around the facility, collecting information. But the client didn't want uh, people near the water. And so the robot can actually traverse that uh, uh, land water interface quite efficiently. Um, so nobody needs to get near the water to do that. <laughs> We're always concerned, of course, in Canada about, about thin ice operations. Shoulder seasons are challenging. Um, typically, people don't do work uh, if they don't have to in, in these kind of environments. We also want to make sure that our robots didn't get stuck. Uh, if we are operating in thin ice, the robots can fall into the, into the water themselves, of course. Um, so this video is just really demonstrating like what happens if we get if we fall through some thin ice. I wanted to make sure that we could self-rescue. Uh, and really for us, that's uh, that's good proof that uh, we can get into all sorts of environments where we don't get stuck. This is a larger robot that we we build, and this this ta this tailings facility was only really accessible by helicopter. Um, and so we were able to get out onto the tailings. Um, you can see that the mud left in the tracks behind the robots quite soft so you can't walk out there you can't drive uh, heavy vehicles but we we're able to get out there with the robot and, and collect samples and do some cpt work in this case um, so we do make uh, robots in a couple different sizes um, you know really we have sort of two in our fleet right now and, and planning for at least a third one um, the smallest one we build is actually still quite large it's about the size of a golf cart uh, about 400 kilograms. Um, we have another one that's almost a thousand kilograms and it's pushing the size of a small car. Uh, and then future roadmap for us would be building much larger vehicles that, that are, are more adept at uh, geotechnical investigations. Um, but again, focusing on water, um, the, the robot we use is Helix Neptune. Um, the robot is, it's a multifunctional platform really designed to carry tools out into uh, water-based or, or various hazardous locations. Um, and so typically it carries things like an echo sounder. Um, we can use single beam or multi-beam. Um, we can do water sampling from it, um, as well as deploying various physical probes into the water. Uh, so pairing nicely with FredSense, we should do some work together. We can grab some samples. Uh, uh, you do the selenium detection, we'll get the samples from a, a column of water. Uh, great partnership there. Um, we've also deployed things like a submersible ROV. We can do underwater inspection then. So the ROV has cameras, but then the two robots sort of uh, piggybacking off each other provide long range radio communications. And then the ROV provides the underwater uh, detection. Uh, and I'll show you, we've got a, a bunch of other tool, tools in the arsenal here that we use. Um, this is our larger robot that we do for use for geotechnical work. Um, all of the robots have uh, a number of onboard cameras so that we can monitor uh, the status of, of um, um, sample collection of the measurements in real time. Uh, in the top right here, you can see this little uh, tripod and radio station. That's typically what a setup on site looks like for us. So it, it's our ground control station that the, the human operators are staying safe on shore and then operating the robots uh, via this uh, radio tower. Um, and so typically in tailings, you know, what, we're, what we primarily do is, is a lot of water-based work. Um, you can see this is sort of a shot through the, the scrolls here of Helix Neptune. There's a, um, we have a, a lifting mechanism that we use to deploy the echo sounder underwater. We, we raise it up when we're on, on land to protect it because especially a multi-beam echo sounder can be uh, very, very expensive. 
Uh, and so we need to be able to protect that as we uh, go into uh, the environment without, without human um, oversight. Uh, so we, we of course, um, get out into the water, we can deploy the echo sounder. Uh, when we do run a bathymetric survey, then we, we uh, the robot monitors its pitch and roll. Um, we also, everything is GPS enabled so that we can track its location uh, within a few centimeters of accuracy with uh, RTK GPS. Uh, we typically run a single beam sonar survey. Um, it's and then we just run various lines back and forth to, to create a, a bathymetric survey map and do water volume calculations. Uh, and this is typically what something like that would look like. Uh, we can enable uh, driving the robot is either with a joystick, um, and so much, much like a video game, you can drive it skid steer like a tank, or we can enable uh, waypoint navigation and, and basically set a number of points and the robot will just follow a grid pattern, turn around when it gets to those points, uh, or whatever path uh, we've set as, as operators ahead of time. Uh, and that enables the robot to then go out for several hours at a time without any human oversight um, and, and just collect survey data. And as long as there's no obstacles in the pond, then it's, it's all pretty efficient and clean. If there are obstacles in the pond, like ropes or, or pipes, uh, then we, we typically just take back control, a uh, human steps in and just drives around them. And then you can watch through live streaming video how to avoid those. Um, I'll skip over this. We, we've actually done a bathymetric survey in the middle of the winter time, just drilling holes through ice. Uh, and we can then actually deploy the echo sounder into the, the unfrozen water below the ice uh, and just measure, measure the depth in, in, in single points. Uh, it's of course not as efficient in the winter time, um, but we can, we can do water volume calculations that way, which can be quite helpful. Um, we've also instrumented uh, Helix Neptune with an ice drill. Um, so here we're specifically measuring the thickness of ice. And so this, this uh, auger that we've got on the, the robot here, uh, it's instrumented to, to sense when it penetrates the bottom layer of ice. Uh, and then can report back a, a value. And the use case here, of course, is if you want to drive an excavator or a, a bulldozer out into frozen tailings, you want to make sure that they're actually frozen. You want to make sure that you've got uh, enough coverage of, of solid ice. So you can send out Helix Neptune ahead of a heavy piece of equipment uh, and guarantee that you're safe before you drive that equipment out. Um, all of our robots have an open payload bay basically in the center. You can see that here, there's sort of a, uh, you can see the water through, you're looking from a camera top down through the robot into the water. Um, and so what that enables us to do is to deploy tools through the center of the robot through the water into the water column. Um, and so this uh, picture in the middle here is uh, a Van Dorn water sampler. Uh, and so we can uh, deploy that. Uh, again, being able to measure the, the depth where we're deploying that within the water column, we can actually collect then a, a series of water samples. Um, so you can take for offsite analysis, uh, you can call FredSense and they can help you out, um, or you can do whatever your normal process happens to be. Um, with water samples, we're, we are only able to collect one sample at a time, but the, the robot then just shuttles it back and forth to human operators on shore, uh, unload, recharge. Typically we just replace the Van Dorn while you're uh, aliquoting out those samples to, to different vessels. Uh, we can also deploy various uh, physical probes. Um, you know, we've used things like a, an XO2 sonde, which, which is a multi-parameter, you know, temperature, um, salinity, those type of physical measures in water. Uh, and again, being able to measure through a water column. Uh, we can do tailing samples. Um, we typically use our larger robot to do tailing samples because we have to push tools into, into tailings. And one of the differences between the two robots is Helix Neptune that I've been talking mostly about here. It's not able to push a tool. It's only able to deploy them off a, off a, a winch line and cable. Um, our larger robot can actually push into tailings. Um, and we can collect multiple samples at a time. And so this is, this is an example of the piston sampler at work here. So we this is uh, very soft tailings. We we're able to push a sampling tool into the tailings. Um, there's a, a, a an 
simultaneously actuated piston, which also draws the tailings into the sampling tube. Uh, and then it, at the top of the video screen, you can see there's some um, bucket sample collection tool um, magazine there that the various columns are being deposited into. Uh, so we can collect layers of, of tailings that way as well. Um, and then various sediment samplers, uh, grab samplers, petite ponars, uh, all sorts of tools uh, can be deployed from the robots. Um, the larger robot I mentioned briefly does, does CPT work. Uh, we have our own uh, digital CPT tools that we use. We also collaborate with um, uh, you know, other large vendors to do that. Um, so all sorts of options there. Uh, we have a vein shear tool, again, that we also deploy from our larger robot. Uh, and we, we've even set up uh, things like a, a rescue arm. Um, if there are equipment that gets stuck in tailings, we're able to actually get out through hazardous material uh, and actually hook up a tow cable. The robot's not strong enough to pull any other equipment out, but we can actually connect the tow cable. So if you were to get a, a bulldozer stuck in a tailings pond, for example, uh, we can run a steel cable out there, connect it to the bulldozer, and then then you connect it uh, onshore to another piece of heavy iron that you can pull it out with. Um, and really just using the robot then as that connection vehicle. Um, and we operate in all sorts of environments. Uh, obviously lots of uh, water cap tailings. Um, they can get pretty big, they can get pretty windy and, and wavy. And, and that's part of the reason why the robot's the size it is. It, it is pretty stable and uh, you know we designed it to be powerful enough to uh, to be able to traverse long beaches into water. Um, you know, beach surveys are, are typically challenging, um, but we've proven pretty effective in those arenas. Um, and you can see here, there's uh, a number of radio beacons on top of the, the robot. We actually use um, 900 megahertz radio, which gives us uh, a couple kilometers of distance so we can control the robot. We use Wi-Fi, which gives us uh, typically in about one kilometer of, of range where we can see live streaming video. Uh, but we've also activated a uh, cellular option as well. So we can actually live stream video via cell data. Uh, and then we can really see it anywhere in the world, uh, which is great. We, we have our own uh, uh, internet connectivity that way. And we can actually monitor then what's happening on a robot anywhere from our office here in Edmonton as well. So that is quite handy. Um, again, the robots are designed not to get stuck, and so uh, this is this is just a it's a great picture of of the robot operating in some very very soft mud. Um, and in the background, you can see some long reeds and vegetation. Uh, the robot's quite capable of just driving over those things. It doesn't really do any damage to the the environment itself. It usually, just sort of flattens things as it drives over it, uh, and they spring back up usually in in no time. Um, this is a, a pit lake, um, you know, able to descend into uh, an environment like this. If if the walls get really steep, if things are, are challenging to crawl down, we do sometimes winch the equipment down. Uh, the robot sometimes has, you know, descending down slippery um, uh, tailings liners. Um, if, you, if you use a, a liner in your tailings pond, those can be slippery. Um, so we sometimes winch the equipment down before it goes and does its survey. Um, and this is this is typically how we show up to site. We we often run what we call robots as a service as a business. Our clients um, aren't generally in in uh, the business of purchasing robots, and so. But if you just need data collected, what we do is is understand the scope of the job, uh, propose uh, you know a, a length of time and and um, you know some data proposed back to you as well as some pricing, and then we show up to site. We do have a field crew with. Uh, lots of experience on in mining operations and, and uh, all the safety training necessary to get to site. Uh, pickup truck and trailer, the robot's very easy to transport. It's all electric dri drive uh, and all batteries. So there's no fluids on board the robot. There's no potential contamination of, of the site because of the robot. The batteries uh, generally give a few hours of operation at a time and we have two sets of batteries where we have one being charged while the other is being discharged. So we can operate a full uh, eight to 10 hour day uh, continuously. Um, and then the, our operators stay safe on shore 
uh, typically operating out of the pickup truck where we, we have a bunch of computers where we're monitoring the robot from. Um, again, uh, winching the robot down a slippery slope, in this case, snow, um, and then driving around in water. Um, yeah, and that is Copperstone in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to chat when it's appropriate. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Craig. Extremely interesting presentation. And uh, thank you to uh, for introducing us all to Helix's capabilities. Thank you. So uh, I see the questions rolling in right now. So again, please keep it going. Uh, Sylvie and I will be sorting through the questions in the background. But again, please uh, keep those questions coming in. Uh, I have to apologize as well. It seems my transition slide was not shared last time. Uh, so I'd like to bring to everyone's attention a uh, hand that has been shared. Uh, it will have everyone's uh, contact information from today for uh, your download. And uh, our final speaker of the day will be Frank Vanderhave, an environmental instrumentation representative from Hoskins Scientific. So with over 38 years experience, Frank continues to advise mining companies and stakeholders on their hydrometric and meteorological instrumentation requirements. <laughs> His expertise in instrumentation has helped develop solutions for some of the most complex wastewater and monitoring issues. So I'll give you the floor now, Frank. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, this uh, this session. It's uh, very great. It's uh, been learning a lot of stuff, and uh, it was quite interesting seeing some of our products that Craig's using as well. All right, let's just get into. I'll just. Uh, I'm assuming that we can see my screen. Uh, oops, there we go. Perfect, looks great. All right, good. So the, uh, again, this, I'm, uh, I've been with Austin for over 38 years there, and I primarily look, look after the uh, hydrometric uh, aspect and the climate aspect of the of the company. And uh, the talk is just gonna basically be on the, on the use of uh, remote monitoring for discharge measurement. Uh, some shots here of just uh, of some workshops and some traditional means of, of how people collect data and a lot of the stuff is is uh, is driven sort of by the the clients needs and, and uh, limitations uh, just on Hoskin those who don't know us we are a multi uh, uh, multi faceted uh, company we uh, constitute three companies within ourselves there's Hoskin events and solutions which is primarily in the the uh, 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 industrial uh, uh, wastewater type side of it and CTH, which is a regional one out of Quebec. So we, and these are just some of the products that, in areas that we get involved with. So, you know, in, traditionally, if we look at, at historically how we, how measurements were done, they were typically done off a cableway, the, uh, on rivers and, and men were basically going over on a cart and seen overhead. Back in about uh, 2010, the, uh, the the cableway network, basically run by Water Survey of Canada, was was undergoing reviews because it had not been maintained. They weren't made to a common standard. There were safety and health issues on there. So they started looking at, okay, how do we get away from a manned system going to more bank-operated systems? And this was sort of the first option: is that they uh, they were using uh, the cableways basically to drag an ADCP which in our case is, is the, uh, uh, we represent Sontec out of, uh, out of uh, San Diego, and they have a variety of units, one for shallow water, which is the uh, RS5 that we see there, and the larger one, that's basically meant for, uh, for rivers. These products are in use with virtually every provincial agency, consulting companies, Water Survey of Canada, and as they go across, they map the bathymetry of the channel, so the cross-sectional area, they measured the velocities, and then they uh, end up coming up with the, uh, determining what the discharge is. The, uh, the issues you can see from here is that how do we, you know, when you're, it's all very nice when you have the ability to go from one side of the channel to the other, either by having a road, a bridge, or some structure of that nature, but in many cases, these, these channels can be far too wide, or they could be, well, essentially, there is no access to the other side. So, hence the need of using remote control vehicles in order to perform the uh, 
the uh, the measurement. In the uh, there's a number of solutions that are made available to us from uh, from different vendors. This one is uh, is basically one for that we use for slow moving rivers, the prairies, for instance, uh, um, small creeks, ch channels. Uh, you can be using for you know for virtually anything that that has a, a velocity of surface water velocity of less than a meter and a half per second. And the inside of it, we have the uh, the ADCP in there. We have a remote control, so there's a couple of uh, pods in there for the for driving the the uh, the boat across. And they uh, then they have a wireless telemetry that can can basically span hundreds of meters. And now from the uh, from the side of the bank, a client can literally just send the boat out. One person themselves actually handling it, go across the channel, take a profile, and then come back again. And essentially, you do this for about four measurements or total uh, total ex what we call exposure time of of 12 minutes, so that we get enough reciprocal readings in place that we can validate the measurement that's being uh, being taken of the uh, of the flow and this is a these the this type of product has been quite popular on the uh, on the prairies again because of the uh, the slower moving uh, streams but what happens when you have something that's a bit you know, a bit faster moving well we have what we call the arc boat light uh, this is a two-piece design and it's proving to be again very popular with uh, with people such as water survey because it transports easily inside of a uh, inside of a helicopter a lot of the uh, other boats have to be suspended underneath which is not the best way of uh, of transporting and, and, and creates issues there whereas when you can put this one inside the storage compartment it makes it very compact and, and very easy to plug. Again, it's it's small enough to be handled by one person. It uses a, uh, a quad a quad setup of, of props, so it has a higher top speed of three meters per second. And the weight of, of being less than you know, under 17 kilograms, including the uh, the ADCP, makes it very attractive to uh, for the uh, the users to to uh, to go out and easy to transport and carry out into the into the field. This is this unit is probably the most popular one that uh, is sold through uh, uh, throughout the country. Uh, it is the uh, one that Water Survey has close to two dozen of them in use uh, in various regions. Uh, it does. The reason being is that it basically does. You know, one boat does all. It's uh, got top speed of five meters per second. It it too has a two-piece uh, design so that the nose or the the bow section comes off, so it too can fit inside the cabin of a helicopter, making it easy to transport. And then the uh, but the size of it allows it to carry a a substantial payload as well. Come on. There we go. The uh, the next vehicle that uh, is out and this is fairly new for is called the HiCat. Uh, all these products actually are the the uh, this one as well as the original one is actually made by by Xylem or provided by Xylem, which is the uh, parent company to Sontec and YSI. And this one's a bit unique in that it is able to handle a variety of things including an AZP but at the same time it could be outfitted with a uh, uh, with an uh, with a side scan sonar as well as multi-parameter instrumentation again top speeds about four meters per second uh, it has quite extended range it's it's quite robust um, and it, it it consequently it's it's it has a certain a different niche than the uh, the other than the, most of the other vehicles. Again, higher price point uh, that's usually associated with it. But if you're doing if you're looking at doing multifaceted um, measurements at the uh, simultaneously, 
then uh, this is this is definitely an option that's made available to you. All these boats that we have, you know, they they were all designed to be bank mounted operated. But of course, the you know, there's been a move for it where it's like, well, why do we have to continue to control the boat? Can we not do this through a uh, you know, do it autonomously? So virtually every package that we have here has an autonomous option. In which case, you just you, they, since they're all equipped with GPS, you can then just apply plot the uh, the track on a software package such as HiPack, and then it controls the boat and does the uh, does the measurement for you. Bit more of a challenge when you get towards the thresholds of the uh, of the vo of the velocity. It's fine if you're doing things like tailing pond uh, work and such. If you're doing you know looking at it and quitting the uh, equipping the the uh, the boat not with one of the uh, echo sounders or using an echo sounder as opposed to an adcp but uh you know in those cases then you you know you generally get a, a very good uh, a very good coverage on it and it's basically fire and forget it just does the work for you and then just comes back and your uh, your measurement is uh, is done the uh, as I say the the devices these boats are basically I would you know I would associate them as being drones in that they the plant the the uh, payload that you apply on it could be can be virtually anything uh, it could be water quality though you're only going to get surface water but uh, you can be you know, equipping it with with uh, single beam echo sounders so you can get your your bathymetric mapping done. We have a couple of options there. For instance, on the uh, one of our ADCPs, the uh, Hydra Surveyor, it actually does the bathymetry, but it also maps the water velocity in the uh, in in the uh, in the area. So whereas our other devices all go out and calculate your discharge based on the measurement going across the channel, when you're mapping it, uh, say a pond or a lake or a, you know dam study or something of that any body of water you can then determine where the flows are uh which direction they're occurring and the the magnitude of them so again it's it's a uh, a, a very versatile tool it's not doesn't go quite as deep as a um as a normal echo sounder does because the frequencies just don't uh, penetrate that far but for work that says less than 40 meters deep it's it's proven to be quite uh, quite popular and essentially that is uh that's that's it excellent thank you very much frank uh again another great and very interesting presentation so uh, now we'll start our uh, question period. I will invite our uh, three speakers to turn their cameras back on right now, and we'll start the conversation going. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so to start off, I think we'll start with a roundtable uh, general question for everyone. Uh, so one question would be, how shallow of a channel can we measure flows in? For uh, Brooks, I'll change the question a little bit to what is the sample volume that is required for um, your different measurement technologies? So uh, I think I'll start from the bottom up here. So uh, Frank, if you'd like to start off. Sure, The our instruments are designed to work in specific ranges. So the smallest device that we have can work in sh waters as shallow as 10 centimeters. Probably 15 is more realistic because we've got a bit of a blanking distance to uh, to work with, but uh, that would provide us with sufficient cell sizes that we can then determine what the uh, what the velocities are. And it becomes very important when you're working at the edge of a channel where you're trying to calculate what the uh, what the flows are. Then, excellent. Thank you so much. I'll uh, pass it over to Craig now for the same question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, Matthew. Sure, no problem at all. So uh, the question was, how shallow of a channel can flows be measured, especially with uh, with helix? So 
you know, similar to Frank, the, the, the tools that we would use, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we use, we work with Hoskin and use some of their actual measurement tools. So, um, you know, there's a limitation in terms of, you know, how deep echo sounders can operate, um, which is standard. You know, our, the robots are designed so that they can get out into uh, basically zero draft of water. Um, so a little bit different than, than some of the boats. Um, we also, we do have a unique tool that we use uh, if we're just measuring the depth of water. That's a mechanical tool that we use. Um, so we can actually measure in the, the depth of water where an echo sounder is no longer effective. Uh, and quite often our echo sounder, um, we find it about 18 inches or 45 centimeters or so. It's, it's gives us noisy data. And so we switch to the mechanical tool at that point. So we can do very shallow beach surveys. Um, but the robot's effective at all of those depths. Excellent. Thank you so much, Craig. And uh, next to Brooks, uh, again, what uh, what type of sample volumes are needed for uh, your uh, measurements? Oh, uh, seems like your mic is uh, you're still muted. No, unfortunately not. How about now? Can you hear me now? That is much better. Excellent. <laughs> um, anywhere between 25 and 50 mils. We can do it as low as 25. Uh, you know, we prefer 50 uh, just because, um, you know, there's some waste that happens in the process of re adding the reagents. Um, so, you know, you can do it as low as 25. As, if you are uh, really good at what you're doing, you can do it as low as 25. With experience, I guess, will come the benefits. Sounds good. Uh, I'll keep you on the line now for a question directly for you, uh, specifically for um, Fred Arsenic. So uh, one of our attendees has asked if Fred can measure pH, TSS, and TDS. Uh, and additionally, a follow-up, how does the sensor deal with interference, specifically from copper for arsenic measurements? Yes. Uh, hi, Sylvie. <laughs> Sylvie actually sent me an email uh, during the presentation, so I have it. Um, uh, I can answer the question. Um, so TPH, TSS, and TDS, we don't have a roadmap for being able to measure. Um, as you can imagine, using a genetic component, there's really no specificity there because we are really looking for that one-for-one -one interaction with a binding site on, on uh, the, the cell wall uh, in order for it to be able to uh, have a signal transduction to occur uh, where the genetic component is then transcribed and reproduce that protein that we want to be able to measure. Um, so it really is very, very precise and uh, acute. And uh, having it something more general like TSS or TDS would be, would, would not, this application, this, this technology wouldn't be useful for. When it comes to copper, um, once, I, once again, it's a similar answer where uh, the specificity is so high because the binding site does not interact copper that we were trying to interact for, for arsenic. So we, 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 what we would do if we were to try to measure copper is we would have a different genetically modified organism that would have a different binding site that would bind specifically to So this allows us to, to essentially remove the, the, the issues around uh, interference and uh, allows us to get the high specificity, as I mentioned. Thank you very much for the detailed answer. Uh, I'll Matt? open up. Oh, yes, right. Sylvie. We have a question here for Craig. And the question is, can you tell us about the boats and the robots, uh, the differences that may exist with yours and the competition? <laughs> competition. So um, I think if you mean like the boats such as uh, Fred, Frank presented, those are, uh, they're excellent. They're well used. Uh, 20, I heard 24 units of Water Survey Canada. That's great. They're, and they're really good in open water and, and used uh, very effectively there. Uh, they can drive quite quickly. So things like five meters per second. So if you have a very large open water um, area to survey, a boat is a great choice for sure. Uh, and I think Frank can speak more to that. In terms of where the robot has more of an advantage, it, um, we typically do a survey at about one meter per second. Um, so, you know, we can drive a little bit faster than that in open water, but um, uh, our 
specialty is where where there's obstacles or debris in the water or there's beaches or there's trouble accessing the water um, that's really where uh, the robot has an advantage uh, in what we we can do uh, i think then as well we can we carry fairly heavy tools so an echo sounder is not not very large uh, can be carried by by both vehicles but um, you know some of the some of the sampling gear or doing sediment surveys um, you know that's something that we're capable of doing quite effectively um, yeah and so I think I think where we get called in quite often to do bathymetry versus versus clients that have had a boat is where they have uh, challenges accessing their water or they have uh, things in their water um, <coughs> That, that just make a boat uh, an impractical choice. Um, hope that helps. Thank you, Craig. And it's uh, just normal that we go over to Frank for his views on perhaps differences and similarities. I, I tend to agree with Craig. I mean, we, we, we're, we're both, you know, we, we both have, our boats have certain aspects which make it popular. I mean, for for being able to transport, if you're doing a flow measurement and you need, you know, you've got to be there rapidly and it's a small package and, a, and it's open water, then the boat works very well. Uh, it's, you know, but you do have to somehow be able to get down to the bank. In Craig's solution, basically, it it drives itself down that way, and it 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 uh, in some respects, you know, you don't want to be near the you know, near, near the uh, the water course. So that uh, you know, there there they, we yes, we do address the same market, but you know price points definitely going to be different but also the just the functionality is uh is is quite a bit for instance again you can do profiling we can't do profiling on on these boats so it uh it, it really becomes a case of you know sort of choosing the 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 right boat for the app for the application they're going to be running into most often excellent thank you so much both of you uh, I have another question for uh, the whole table here. Uh, I know this was talked about a little bit in all of your presentations, but I was wondering if you could clarify how the data is shared or transmitted from a, let's say, user's perspective. Uh, a second follow-up question to this would be if it's transmitted wirelessly, is there any security or encryption that is used for this? So I'll uh, start at the top of the table this time, Brooks. Oh, having uh, microphone issues again, unfortunately. Yeah, technology isn't it great. Uh, am I back? I'm back now, aren't I? Yeah, I can see some nods. Um, okay, so because our technology is essentially a spot test, uh, there's no use for continuous, uh, uh, continuous, uh, you know, data gathering. Um, it's essentially you you get a number. You know, we have a system that it plugs in. I showed you the software. It plugs into our computer to a laptop or a laptop that's supplied. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's IT issues, we can try to get around that. But, you know, you basically pull the data up on the software and then it, it, you can plug it into anything. Now, we do have some, some connectivity with LIMS and um, uh, a SCADA. So, you know, we, do, we, we can do it, it wirelessly through LIMS and SCADA. Um, as far as the protocol is concerned, that's not within my wheelhouse. I'd have to ask our IT uh, team to find out what the protocol is. Um, but I do know we have that connectivity. Um, but most of our customers, as of, as of late or uh, up to date, uh, typically have just taken the number and they've recorded it, uploaded it into their system manually. So, because it's a spot test, really. Cool, oh, perfect, great answer. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll pass it now, uh, Craig, as well. So again, uh, how is the data shared or transmitted? And if it's wireless, uh, is there any security or encryption? Uh, thanks. So we. Um, I guess yes. We we store the, the all the data on the robot, and then for redundancy, we also transmit it uh, wirelessly. Uh, store it on the ground station, which was that radio uh, antenna station, uh, and then it can also be transmitted through the cloud back to our office. So there is quite a bit of data transmission going on for us. Um, and yes, so we do. We it is uh, secured and encrypted in that way. Um, there isn't any client-facing information that that gets transmitted in terms of um, there's GPS location information, so that that is involved, um, but not uh, client names or anything like that. But uh, again, the, just having encrypted it, it should be good there. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Frank, I'll pass the same question to you. So 
in our, in our case, the ACPs do store the data internally on the units, and that's sort of the, we call that sort of the definitive file. But it is transmitted by uh, either, you know, depending on the on the generation of product was sent by Bluetooth, in which case the radio is repaired. But the the data itself is in a proprietary format. So unless the radios are paired and you actually have the software to use it, it's very difficult sort of to determine what actually you're you're reading uh, you know, or getting the value on. And the devices only talk to one on one at at a time. So again, you know the and, and then at that point, once the data is stored and down you know, sent over to you, it's stored in your laptop and however you want to disseminate it through whatever security means, that's purely up to you. But you know, from our case, it's just getting the data from off the uh, on the boat just down to the shoreline. And the reason being is that for quality assurance, we have to see data in real time so that we know that our our measurements are within the you know, required are the accepted standards that we are, and uh, and then once it's done, then the the measurement is basically closed off, and away we go. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, I think I'll wrap up with one more roundtable question. Uh, essentially, what are the uh, next steps, or I guess next research that you're doing? Uh, just a one minute uh, quick speech on what your uh, next focuses are. I'll start off at the top again with Brooks. So I, I'm pretty sure I'm good now. <laughs> you guys can hear me. Um, so uh, PFAS is um, perfluoral, perfluoral alkyl substances that are quite prevalent within a lot of groundwater systems. Um, you know, not all of them, but there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of them they are contaminated in. Uh, and surface water as well as wastewater and any uh, um, you know military sites, it's it's a cr incredibly a, a, an issue. And if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, please get educated on it. It's, it's they call it the forever chemical. Um, we are developing this. Is our the, the massive part of our operation is develop this kit for PFAS as well as selenium. Selenium is kind of uh, being done in tandem with PFAS. Uh, there's two different projects. The platform for PFAS is a bit different. We're actually using antibodies instead of uh, genetically modified organisms with their genetic component, it's actually an antibody that's binding uh, to the PFAS molecules. Um, we're getting, we, we need to be able to get specificity for PFAS down into the low parts per trillion range, even touching on three digit parts per quadrillion to be able to get actual compliance measurements done. So these are the levels at which PFAS is being regulated. And so it's extremely difficult to be able to get to those numbers. Um, and you know, and I mentioned selenium in the presentation. You know, that's a big one for mining that we are going after. Uh, and so, you know, iron and manganese and uh, and lead, uh, and BTEX uh, are all secondary as well as nitrates. Uh, they're all going to be coming over the course of the next year and a half uh, to a year. Uh, some of them, you know, as short as nine months or six months. So. Thank you, Brooks. Sounds like a pretty uh, pretty busy timeline there. And uh, next, Craig, uh, if you could share next steps. Yeah, for us, we're working on uh, uh, just continuing to make Helix Neptune more e efficient at its, at its job. Uh, we're pretty happy with uh, all of the performance we've had so far. We've been operating that robot for uh, for just over a year now, and, and it's, been, it's, it's put a lot of miles on it uh, around North America to different, different facilities. So continuing to just sort of spread the word on what we do there. Um, and then really for us, the next major development is, is back on the heavier sort of geotechnical side of what we do. There's, there's a lot of improvements we need to make in terms of our technology there. So, um, and then once we, once we get through that, we might revisit on the water side and, and you know, make it maybe a smaller robot or something like that, something that um, is more uh, unifunctional, uh, but still has some of the amphibious nature of what we basically do. So. Thank you, Craig. A lot of approaches there too. And uh, finally, Frank, any uh, any future developments you'd like to share? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, the majority of the measurement, uh, the uh, movement going ahead uh, for our suppliers is is just improving what they've already got. In, in the case of the boats. The large boat we have is is you know, the first one I worked on was back in 2012, and it's an inboard outboard design, and it's getting a bit dated, um, simply because technology has moved on, and these motor pods that we have provide the same functionality but simplicity and and benefits in the uh, in the fact that the boats are lighter, 
but also there's no uh, through points through the hull where water can migrate into. Because when it, with any boat, I mean, they all at some point water does get in, so that's a big part. And then the the uh, there's certainly more movement towards everybody just improving on the autonomous side of thing. I think everybody realizes that you know these software just has become a bit easier and a bit more intuitive to use because your you know, technicians are operating different instrumentation and having to suddenly you know get into it in a big way and, and understand how this particular software works. You know when they they realize that the simpler they make it the more, more acceptable it becomes with the uh, with the the market in general. Perfect. Thank you very much, Frank. So uh, I think with that, I'm going to bring the uh, webinar to a close. Uh, I would recommend to all of our participants to please download the handout with uh, contact information for all of our speakers today. Uh, you can send an email to them, uh, which then they'll be able to share additional information or expertise uh, with you. So with that, again, thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Uh, fantastic jobs all around, and it was great to hear about your um, new uh, innovative technologies. Thank you so much. So um, in closing, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank all of our attendees, uh, again, for your time and interest in the webinar. Uh, I'd also like to bring you to attention that Sylvia shared on the screen a call for assistance with ESRS's response to a Canadian Securities Administrators Consultation on NI 43-101. So this is to update the standards of standards of disclosure, excuse me, for mineral projects last amended in 2011. So quite some time ago at this point. Uh, if anyone is interested in assisting, please contact Jennifer Hill at the email provided in the handout. Uh, individuals can also submit their comments for review. Uh, again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much to Sylvie for all of her help today. And I hope everyone has a great long weekend and happy Canada Day. All the best. Take care.